Welcome to the tale of two doctors in disseminated TB when you really need a nurse case manager webinar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jeannie Fong, a program manager at the Curry Center. This webinar is one session in the nurse education series by the TBCOEs and NTNC. We have over 450 participants joining us from across the United States. Please look for further announcements from the TBCOEs and NTNC for upcoming sessions in the Nurse Education Series. Here are a list of few upcoming sessions in 2018 and 2019. Today's session is being recorded and will be archived on our, webinar, on our website. Please look out for an email announcing when it will become available in two to three weeks. You all have been placed on mute in order to preserve the quality of the recording. If you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please feel free to share them in the chat box. The faculty will address the questions during the Q&A period at the end of the presentation. If you're listening via the phone, please enter the code provided to you within the Adobe Connect to link your phone and number if you haven't already done so. This code would be automatically displayed to you if you select the phone option on the audio menu. It can also be located by clicking on the lowercase letter I in the upper right hand corner. This can help us manage any audio problems that may arise. This webinar is produced by the Curry International Tuberculosis Center, which is part of the University of California, San Francisco. And we are located in Oakland, California. The Curry Center is one of four TB centers of excellence for training and education and medical consultation. We cover the western region of the US, which is shown in the purple on the map. Our region consists of 17 jurisdictions and also includes the US Pacific Island Territory. This project was funded by the CDC's cooperative agreement as a project of the University of California, San Francisco. The Curry Center is approved provider of continuing education by the California State Board of Registered Nurses. This webinar is approved for a total of one continuing education contact hour for nurses. To receive nursing units, you must have registered for the webinar, participated in the entire training, and completed the online evaluation. The evaluation link will be emailed to all registered course participant immediately following the webinar. We ask that you complete it within one week. Pre-registration is important so that we can ensure that we don't exceed the capacity of the Zobi Connect webinar system. However, as mentioned earlier, if any individuals or group members have, pre have not pre-registered, please enter your name and email in the chat so that you can receive an evaluation link Complete. Today's faculty have signed a declaration of disclosure and indicated they have nothing to disclose. Now it's my great ple pleasure to introduce one of today's facilitators, Ann Raftery. Ann? Thank you, Jeannie. And welcome, everyone, to this inaugural webinar in the National TB Nurse Case Management Series. I'm the nurse coordinator here at the Curry International Tuberculosis Center. And I'm honored to be co-facilitating this webinar with our Washington State TB nurse consultant, Lana K. Tyre, and our guest presenter from Snohomish County, Washington, Alba Suarez. Lana is the TB nurse consultant at the Washington State Department of Health and also chairs the National TB Nurse Certification Work Group within the National TB Nurses Coalition. Lana, you just returned from a TB and leprosy screening effort in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. So welcome back. And thank you for helping to facilitate this webinar today. Lana, would you like to just say hello? 
Hi, everyone. Thank you, Curry Center, for the invitation to co-facilitate this webinar. Very glad to be here. I'll be watching for everybody's questions in the chat box, too. Thanks, Lana. Really great to have your help with this. So this is our agenda for today's webinar. Following the case presentation, we will open up the phone line for questions that you may have for our guest pre presenter. Um, you can also uh, post your questions in the chat box, as Lana mentioned, during the case presentation, and we will address them during the question and answer period. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the presenter for today's webinar, Elba Suarez. Elba has been a nurse for over 20 years, but only recently joined forces in the fight against tuberculosis. For the past year, she has been working as a TB nurse case manager for Snohomish Health Department in Everett, Washington. During her first few months there, she received this very challenging TB case to case manage. Let me turn things over now to Alba, who has graciously agreed to share her experience navigating the treatment and care for a patient with disseminated tuberculosis, multiple comorbidities, and medical providers. Alba. And thank you for that introduction and the opportunity to present this case to you all today. As Anne said, my name is Alba Suarez, and I have been working for the health department for just over a year now. In just this short amount of time, I've grown to appreciate how valuable our work as nurse case managers is to our patients, their families, and the service providers involved in their care. In today's case study, I will share my experience as a nurse case manager coordinating patient care between two physicians, one being the managing provider and the other the TB medical consultant. I'll present some of the issues that I encountered and guide you through the thinking process and interventions that led to their resolution. My hope is that you find this presentation interesting and informative. Upon completing this presentation, you will be able to describe several case management challenges encountered while coordinating care for a patient that is quite complicated and you'll be able to name at least three nurse case management interventions that were applied to ensure the patient's needs were addressed. As many of you know, the ultimate goal of our work in case management is to provide patient-centered care for the completion of treatment and ensure that all public health activities related to stopping TB transmission are completed. Simply put, we want to cure the patient and keep TB from spreading to others. As nurse case managers, then, our responsibility is to coordinate the patient's care to make sure that the patient's medical as well as psychosocial needs are met, and to accomplish this through the appropriate use of the resources that we have. This all sounds pretty simple and straightforward, but what does this look like in practical terms? The patient I will be sharing with you today showcases what co patient coordination looks like and how complicated it can get sometimes. So let me begin. It all started with a call from the patient's pulmonologist reporting culture results that were positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis from a bronchoalveolar lavage specimen collected almost four weeks earlier. The patient is a 40-year-old Asian male who immigrated from a highly TB endemic country. He was being managed by an infectious disease provider for peritoneal TB and had started the standard four-drug anti-TB regimen five days earlier. I'd like to take a moment to address reporting regulations here. In Washington State, cases of confirmed TB as well as cases of suspected TB are reportable to the health department by the providers and the laboratories. In this case, the extrapulmonary TB was not reported by the lab nor the provider. Not sure how that happened, but it happens from time to time. The bottom line here is that the pulmonologist made the appropriate referral. My job as the patient's nurse case manager is not affected by who refers the case. Nevertheless, it's important to know the laws in case a provider calls wanting to know what they should report. After taking the referral, I asked myself, what is the immediate information the TB medical consultant is going to want to know? I called the office of the treating physician who was the ID doctor to find out more about what had happened leading up to the patient's TB diagnosis. 
I requested progress notes, chest x-ray images, and copies of all lab results. As the treating physician was not yet aware that the patient's BAL culture was positive, I informed him of the results and explained that because the patient has pulmonary TB, the health department would now be involved in the patient's care. As I reviewed the patient's records, I looked for any labs that confirmed the TB diagnosis, such as a positive nucleic acid ampli amplification test or positive culture. I also reviewed the radiology reports, looked to see if the patient had any other medical conditions, and reviewed patient demographics such as country of origin, as this may have be useful in assessing if multidrug resistant TB is a possibility. My goal was to notify the TB medical consultant as soon as possible with the information that I had gathered. We tried to notify the TB medical consultant the same day or within 24 hours from receiving the referral. From the review of the patient's records, I learned that the patient's medical history was quite involved and that he had been a challenge to diagnose. Two years earlier, he had been diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis an inflammatory autoimmune disease affecting the spine and causing pain and stiffness. His rheumatologist had assessed TB prior to starting the immunosuppressant therapy and all test results were negative at that time. And he also started treatment with TNF alpha inhibitor to suppress the autoimmune response and with prednisone to control the inflammation. About six months later, the patient was worked up for TB following the development of pulmonary nodules seen on a CT scan. A diagnosis of sarcoidosis was given after TB cultures returned negative. Soon after, though, the patient developed a cough. His con condition continued to worsen with fevers, night sweats, abdominal distension, and weight loss over the course of several months. A follow-up chest CT showed further progression of the nodular disease, a new pleural effusion, and metastinal adenopathy. The patient's pulmonary and peritoneal specimens were obtained and sent for AFB smear and culture. The smears were negative. However, about a month after the smear specimens were sent, the cultures grew mycobacterium tuberculosis. As the peritoneal fluid was the first to grow, the patient was referred to an infectious disease specialist who started him on treatment for peritoneal TB. Then the pulmonary specimen was positive and we were notified. And this is what the chest x-ray looked like in December. So as a new case manager, one of my first questions was, what was the management of this patient going to look like? What was I responsible for doing? As mentioned, the patient was already under the care of an infectious disease provider for peritoneal TB. But because the patient also had pulmonary TB, by Washington state law, the TB medical consultant had to be involved in monitoring the patient's progress and offering guidance. As it turned out, the ID doctor expressed interest in remaining the primary provider responsible for the patient. The TB medical consultant and I agreed that we would continue to follow our protocols for monitoring patients with active TB. We would provide the TB medication and start directly observed therapy. To avoid any miscommunications or confusion, it was agreed that I would discuss any patient issues directly with him and he would in turn communicate with the ID doctor whenever necessary. Once we had our roles figured out, we had the issue of convincing the patient that we needed to be involved in his care. To assist with that, we asked the ID clinic to call the patient and tell him that we had to be involved in managing his care and this got us in the door. Normally, our protocol is to visit a patient within 24 hours of receiving orders from the TB medical consultant. However, this patient already had an appointment with his ID doctor so my first home visit with the patient was postponed until the next day. Meanwhile, I had plenty of things to work on in preparation for that first visit. The TB medical consultant had asked that I find out a bit more information about the patient. Specifically, he wanted to know the schedule for the patient's prednisone taper 
and the last dose of the patient's immunosuppressant. To find these two pieces of information, I requested notes from the rheumatologist. I also looked for some specific lab reports and secured a copy of the abdominal images from the radiology department. He ordered additional lab work, including a complete metabolic panel, an HIV test, as well as AFB smears and cultures of the patient's sputum and urine. A very important aspect of patient care is to try to identify potential problems and take appropriate measures to help mitigate or prevent them altogether. To do this, the TB consultant wrote a progress note that included specific guidance for patient management and asked that I forward it to the managing provider, the primary care physician, and the rheumatologist. In his note, he warned of the risk for IRIS, which stands for Immune Reconstitution Inflammatory Syndrome. What happens with IRIS is that after the immunosuppressant drug is stopped, the body's immune system is revived and it reacts by mounting an exaggerated inflammatory response. This response, he notes, may include malaise, fatigue, fever, sweats, and anorexia. He also cautions that we may see lymphadenopathy, worsening of his pulmonary fusions, or unmasking of a currently subclinical central nervous system involvement. He suggests that it may take a prednisone taper lasting two to three months to prevent iris. As a nurse case manager, it was important that I understand this potential risk for iris so that I could stay alert for signs and so I could educate the patient about it. During the first home visit, I did the usual case management activities, including introducing myself, explaining my role in establishing rapport, educating the patient about the disease, answering his questions, discussing isolation requirements and signing consent for treatment, conducting patient assessment, including a review of his medications, and asking about contacts. I also asked the patient to tell me about his doctor's visit the day before to find out if any labs have been done so we weren't duplicating any tests. During the assessment, the patient admitted to feeling fatigued, nauseated, feverish, and short of breath. He downplayed his symptoms, saying that he was actually feeling better. As ordered, I drew blood for a CMP and HIV and instructed him on the procedure for sputum and urine specimen collection. I also told the patient that the TB consultant would like another chest x-ray. The patient was questioning why the TB consultant, whom he had never met, was requesting all of these labs. After all, he had just been seen by his ID doctor the day before. I explained the reason for each of the labs and that they would be shared with his doctor. I assured him that we were in communication with his managing provider and would not duplicate any labs. I stressed the benefit of having a nurse manager and all the services that I could offer him and his family, including making sure that his toddler and wife were screened for TB and treated if necessary. The patient strongly resisted the need for directly observed therapy, since his managing provider had already given him a month's supply of medication, and he was perfectly capable of self-administering. To resolve this, we explained the policies for managing cases of active pulmonary TB and our responsibilities. We agreed to a trial of video DOT and that was a compromise that he was happy with. In the medication review, the patient reported that he had not been taking his prednisone taper because he just didn't want to take so many pills. We explained the purpose and importance of the prednisone and how it was used to prevent iris. I alerted the TB consultant that the patient was not taking his prednisone. I reminded myself to routinely ask the patient about how his prednisone taper was coming along. Now for a new nurse, that visit was obviously a lot to deal with. Fortunately, my nursing supervisor had come along with me. From the beginning, she was there helping me with all the issues that came up. She took special note that the patient was experiencing nausea, even though he was taking antiemetics. He also had mentioned some fatigue, and this concerned her. So the next day, and yes, it was a Saturday, she called the lab for results. The results were surprising. 
His liver function test results were very abnormal, with AST results 27 times the upper limit of normal. So now is a good time to pause for a polling question. What would you do in this situation? Please take a moment to log your answer from the options given here. We'll take a few more seconds. Okay, the polling question is now closed and we'll review the answers. The answer here is D. And looks like a lot of you chose that. Great. The best approach was to tell the patient not to take his TB medications and to immediately notify the TB consultant. So the standard protocol for abnormal liver labs results is that if they're three times the upper limit of normal, and the patient has symptoms, or if they're five times the upper limit of normal without symptoms, the rule of thumb is to stop medications immediately and call the TB consultant right away. All right, so that afternoon, the patient was admitted to the hospital with drug-induced liver injury and placed on a liver-sparing regimen. During his three weeks in the hospital, his problems included symptoms of iris with rashes, fevers, worsening pleural effusions, and hypoxic respiratory failure, to name a few. He had become quite ill, and I soon realized that even though the patient was in the hospital, my job as a nurse case manager did not, excuse me, did not stop, and neither did that of the TV consultant. While I was in the hospital, my case management activities included calling the hospital and inquiring about the patient's status and alerting the TV consultant with critical information or any major changes, coordinating care with the hospital staff to make sure the test that the TB consultant ordered got done. As the patient was from a country with high rates of drug resistance, our consultant ordered the, both the rapid molecular-based drug susceptibility test, the MDDR, and the midget drug susceptibility test, which takes several weeks to get results. The other significant activity I did was to support the wife who was worried about her husband's condition. She didn't know how to drive, and she didn't know how to call the hospital to get updates on her husband. She was afraid to ask her friends for help for fear they would find out that her husband had tuberculosis. I showed her how to contact the nursing station for information on her husband, and I provided transportation to help her get chest x-rays for herself and her child so that we could continue with the contact screening process. By doing these things for her, I was able to build rapport and show the family how our involvement was useful and needed. Once the patient was discharged, I focused my attention on acquiring the hospital information and forming a management plan. I requested and carefully reviewed the discharge records, recent labs, and medication regimen from the hospital and shared these with our TB consultant. I requested and reviewed the hospital medication administration record in order to keep an accurate dose count. I double-checked the dosages and made sure they were weight appropriate. I made arrangements to get the new medications ready for directly observed therapy, which included ordering a very expensive second-line drug called cycloserine. I also read up on the new medications and familiarized myself with the side effects for each of them. I learned that while on amikacin, baseline, and monthly hearing assessments should be done, and, I'm while, and while on cycloserine, baseline and monthly screening 
for psychiatric symptoms such as depression should also be done. To help me out with this, I use the Curry Center's Drug-Resistant Tuberculosis, a survival guide for clinicians. Chapter 5 has medication fact sheets, which are very helpful. This book is available from the Curry Center, and you can also view it online for free. Some questions that came up for me were, how will the IV amicacin be managed and by who? The amicacin, I was told, will be managed by an infusion agency. Well, that still didn't answer how it would be managed. In particular, I wanted to know if the agency nurses were going to be conducting the monthly hearing assessments. I contacted the infusion services, service agency several times trying to get the plan and was unsuccessful. Through asking the patient, I find, found out some details and that he had never had a hearing assessment. Even though I was not responsible for managing the amicacin, I did have the responsibility for providing patient-centered care and for ensuring the patient's safety where it was under my control. I had the resources that I needed, which was the audiometer, so I just added monthly hearing assessments to my plan. And as, a, as we'll see, it was a good thing that I did. Visiting the patient after he was discharged felt a lot like the initial visit. Activities included discussing the plan of care, assessing the patient, reviewing the TB medications and what side effects to watch out for, reviewing the prednisone taper instructions and the importance of taking it, discussing the amicacin administration and how that was going to be managed, and finally stressing the importance of calling me or his ID doctor if he had any problems or concerns. Again, I had more questions about the amicacin. This time, I wondered about the timing. The patient was not given instructions by the agency as to when to do the IV infusions, so he was choosing to do those infusions one hour, those one hour infusions in the evening. I asked the TB consultant if the timing of the infusion really mattered. For the TB treatment to be effective, he responded, the amicacin infusion should be done around the same time as the oral medications. I tried explaining this to the patient, but the patient resisted the change. Again, he thought it was too much medication at one time. To solve this, the TB consultant set, sent a recommendation to the managing physician. The agency then stepped in and ordered the patient to move the infusions closer, closer to the oral meds a few hours at a time. It was beginning to feel that managing this patient was always going to include an extra step or two. A week after being discharged, I got a text that said, my husband has 105 fever since yesterday. I didn't see the text until late Sunday when I responded by telling her to have him go to the ER or call the ID doctor. She responded, he's okay now. This incident brings to mind the importance of instructing family members or caregivers on who to contact after hours in case of an emergency. Apparently, I had explained this to the patient, but the wife was not in the room when the conversation took place, so she was unaware of who to call. So Monday morning at 8 o'clock, I called to follow up on the situation. The patient didn't answer his phone. The wife informed me that he was still having fevers and he didn't want to go to the ER and he wouldn't give her the phone number to call his doctor. I decided to do a home visit. In assessing the patient, I noticed an itchy rash on the torso and extremities and fever. His heart rate and respiratory rate were abnormally fast and he was short of breath. He downplayed his symptoms again. I was baffled by the patient's unwillingness to seek care or to listen to his wife. This posed a challenge for me. How do I get the patient in to see his managing provider? I tried to reason with him and focus on the rash, which was a very obvious sign that his body was reacting to something. He explained that in the ER, the doctors wouldn't know him 
and wouldn't know what to do. We agreed that he would just call the doctor's office and see what they recommended. I showed the wife how to call the clinic and what to say and remained with her during the call to help her out. They referred him to the ER. The patient again refused, but he agreed to go to the clinic to see his doctor in the afternoon. The next day, I requested the progress, progress notes from the visit to see what had happened. Apparently, the patient was showing signs of iris as he was coming down from his prednisone taper too soon. So he was restarted on another prednisone taper. The next morning, the outreach worker visited the patient for his regularly scheduled DOT. But before giving the medication, he called to report that the patient's rash had worsened. His eyes were swollen, and the patient had been vomiting the night before. So let's take a moment here for another polling question. What would you do in this case? Make your choices from the answers below. Okay, we'll take a few more a few more seconds to answer. Okay, we've closed the polling question. Let's go over the answers. Great. Uh, most of you did choose E, which um, is the best answer, is to get the patient on the phone to make a quick assessment and also to ask the outreach worker to hold the TB medication. There were some people who chose uh, just to tell the patient to go to the ER. However, in this situation, it would be difficult. One, um, the patient would have to drive himself, and his eyes were swollen, and his wife couldn't drive him because she didn't know how to drive. Um, so very important here to make sure that he did not get any TB medications until he was assessed. So while the outreach worker was there, he took a picture of the patient's swollen eyes and sent it to me, and I asked him to get the patient on the phone so I could do an assessment. I found out that the symptoms had been developing since the night before, and he was not having any trouble breathing. I asked the patient to call his ID doctor while the outreach worker waited, and the doctor agreed to meet the patient in the emergency department. Arrangements were made to provide transportation to the hospital. I notified the TB consultant immediately so that if the ID doctor called to consult him, the TB consultant would be well aware of the situation. This incident further confirmed the need to keep a close eye on this patient because he just didn't seem to reach out and report when he was having problems. Until this patient is stabilized, Video DOT was not going to be an option. Later that day, the, his doctor called and told me to discontinue the levofloxacin as he felt that the patient was probably reacting to it. I made sure to notify the TB consultant of the medication change. Over the course of the next month, we continued to see this pattern of the patient not reporting problems or seeking care. I would get him to agree to call his doctor, but he would put it off until his symptoms, primarily his fevers, got worse. He wouldn't go to the lab to get the blood test that his managing doctor ordered. His wife was becoming quite frustrated with him, at one point texting me, he is being completely careless. More and more, it appeared that the patient's primary focus was just getting to work and not taking any more time off. So to deal with this situation, I uh, often encouraged him to, prior to prioritize his health. I scheduled monthly home visits 
early in the morning before he left for work, and when his ID doctor wanted him to come in for labs, I would draw the labs and fax the results to his doctor. I often discussed challenges and sought advice from my supervisor and from the TV medical consultant. On February 28th, during his scheduled monthly assessment, his hearing test showed some clear abnormalities, and the patient admitted that he had had some ringing in his ears. I faxed the hearing test along with the baseline test to the TB consultant. He asked that I tell the patient to stop amicacin immediately and that I notify the managing provider. I explained to the patient that he had to stop the amicacin. I had also to reassure him that it was the right thing to do and that he would be working with the ID doctor on this. Stopping the amicacin was not a straightforward task. As instructed, I faxed the abnormal hearing test results and the TB consultant's orders to stop the amicacin to the managing provider. The next day, I followed up by checking in with the patient to make sure the message had come through. To my surprise, I found out that instead of stopping the amicacin, the managing provider had prescribed a lower dose and the infusion agency had already FedExed a new supply of amicacin to the patient. I asked the patient to hold the amicacin until I could clarify the situation. The TB consultant called the managing provider and finally the amicacin was discontinued altogether. The patient was then referred to an audiologist for evaluation of his hearing loss and tinnitus. This situation showed me how important it was that I keep a close eye on patient management and not assume that things will get done just because I faxed a note. So in the interest of time, we'll now fast forward six months. The patient is now nine months into his 18-month treatment plan. The ringing in his ears is almost completely gone, although I don't know if his hearing improved because he didn't see the audiologist again and he didn't care for any more hearing tests. He's no longer on prednisone and no longer at risk for iris. He's doing video DOT very well. He's gained about 20 pounds. He's tolerating his medications very well. And his recent chest x-ray actually showed great improvement. I expect that case management for the next nine months will be a bit easier, especially because I've learned to work with him and his managing provider. So in conclusion, here are some of the key points I'd like to stress when managing a patient with two providers. Keep informed of the patient's provider, excuse me, keep informed of the patient's, of the provider's treatment plan and clarify any issues or questions regarding patient care. Facilitate communication between the two doctors, and this includes not just faxing recommendations from the TB consultant to the managing provider, but calling the clinic and making sure that the managing provider actually got the information. Be proactive and step in when you identify a gap in care. Don't assume that the other provider is taking care of it. Involve the managing provider in helping you to get the patient's cooperation when needed. After all, they usually have an established relationship with the patient, and that can be leveraged. And lastly, remember that if you think managing a patient with two providers is a bit confusing, imagine how the patient may feel. So try to keep the patient up to date with management and treatment plans often, and remind them that they're treating provider and the TB consultant are in communication behind the scenes and they're working together on his treatment plan. And with that, I'm going to conclude this presentation here so as to allow some time for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Elba. What an amazing case that you just described. Um, here's Elba's information if you would like to contact her about any um, information that she's presented today or simply to congratulate her for an amazing job well done I think. Um, so we're going to open it up now to um, questions that you may have. We will first take questions from the phone 
to pose a question, you'll need to press star six to unmute your phone. Uh, before asking the question, if you could just identify yourself, where you're calling from, and then state your question. So we'll open it up now for questions. I'll give just another few seconds for a question to come in. Otherwise, I'll take um, a few questions that came up during the presentation. Okay, so while um, those of you that may be shy to ask over the phone, maybe I'll just start with some of the questions that came in during, the, um, during your presentation, Elba. Um, there was a question from Emma who was curious about uh, when the patient was experiencing the swollen eyes and, and I think the rash, um, and you did an assessment over the phone. Um, Emma was wondering if, if there was just no access to ambulance services or why was that not an option? Yeah, good question, Emma. I didn't consider ambulance services because uh, the eyes were not completely closed. He wasn't showing any other swelling in the throat, no trouble breathing. Um, the patient was usually against the emergency room type um, of uh, decision. He seemed, um, he was comfor more comfortable with just going to um, the emergency room without the ambulance. I, I never did consider his situation at that time to require that type of uh, emergency. Okay, thanks, Selba. Yeah, I was thinking that probably was it. Certainly, he seems like somebody that needed a lot of convincing in order to seek um, care from his doctor. So getting him in that you probably really needed to have good reason to call um, emergency services. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll on to Lana um, and see if there were any questions that you've pulled um, pulled out. Yeah. Um, so there was a question about isolation. Um, so when was the patient cleared to work, um, if at all? And then uh, what is your criteria for clearance to work again after an active TB diagnosis? Yeah. So from what I recall, um, his sputums were negative. Um, it was only his BAL uh, that was positive and um, the abdominal fluid. Uh, his sputums were always negative. Um, cult they cultured out negative also. So um, he was cleared to work after we had the three negative uh, sputums. And um, he was very eager to get to back to work. So that was good. Um, and this kind of actually leads into a question that just came in um, about the sensitivity report. Um, what was the uh, the MDDR report and the um, the growth space sensitivities? Do you remember? Oh yeah, um, he was susceptible. Uh, the bacteria was susceptible to everything, so he ha he didn't have any problems there. Great. Um, and was there, a, there's a question from Julie um, about the medication regimen as well, just wondering if there was um, any discussion or attempt to um, reintroduce the first-line drugs um, after the liver function test returned to normal. Do you remember any discussion about that being an option? Uh, yeah. Back when he was in the hospital, they did try to uh, reintroduce uh, Rifampin, and it looked like he um, had developed a rash, so um, they they didn't uh, want to go that route. But uh, his doctors um, did try, and um, he would develop rash, and so they just uh, uh, once he got out of the hospital, though they did um, discontinue the cyclosarine. Amikacin got discontinued, of course, and he was put back on um, Ethambutol, INH, and moxifloxacin, and some vitamin B6. So that's what he is currently on, and he's tolerating the medications very well. 
Okay, great. Yeah, I, I know you had to shorten the case um, for this case presentation. Certainly, you could have um, given a whole other chapter or two, I think, um, in the things that you had to navigate for this patient. Um, maybe we'll just take another moment and see if there are any questions from callers on the phone line. Again, star six to unmute your phone. I see a question from Julie about the audiometer. And um, I'd like to go ahead and answer that. Um, we do have an audiometer. We're very fortunate that we have um, that resource. Uh, so I did um, pull that out and read the manual on that because I didn't know how to use one. And I also uh, Googled um, the audiometer, um, the manufacturer's um, YouTube video and looked at how it was um, performed. So I, I did have to learn how to do that, but it was um, easy to um, to, to train myself to do that. Great. I was thinking it's not surprising that home health um, or the infusion services wouldn't probably normally be asked about having to do that as part of um, providing the infusion for amikacin. Um, certainly, amikacin isn't used for long periods of time for treating other conditions. Really, for TB, it's pretty unique that a patient would get it for such a long time and, and that hearing loss would be a concern. Right. Uh, Lana, is there any other questions that you're seeing are coming in? Yes, I'm staying on top of them. Okay, um, so uh, let's see. Let's go over to, um, Let's see, there's quite a few questions about, there was one that came in recently about video DOT. Um, so just kind of asking about um, your protocol with video DOT in your program um, and the specific question about if you use FaceTime or you know what kind of platform do you use? Yeah, good question. So video DOT is an option for our patients. It's up to the nurse's discretion as to whether the patient would qualify to do video DOT. Um, we look for patients that are stable, for patients that are responsible, or they're going to, I mean, we can count on them to call in. They have to be able to use the phone. Uh, if they don't have one, we can um, offer them one. Um, they do have to sign an agreement, and we have to review uh, all of the, their responsibilities to um, agree to a scheduled time, et cetera. And um, one of the other things that we have them agree is that for confidentiality reasons, they are not to say their name or talk about any of their symptoms. If they want to do any of that, then um, they're referred to talk to the nurse. Not to um, because the video DOT is done also by uh, outreach workers, but it works very well, and um, we're fortunate to be able to to use that resource. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question from Kathy, uh, wondering about why he was on the medication for so long. Why why the long duration of treatment if he did not have MDR TB? And I'm guessing, um, maybe I'll just let, let you answer that, Alba, what, what your understanding is as to the duration of treatment for, for this patient. Well, what I understand is that, um, first of all, he, he was, you know, he has a, had TB that was disseminated. And also, he was not on uh, rifampin, uh, which that would have shortened his course. That's what I understand. But um, his uh, managing provider and the TV consultant uh, are hesitant to try to start, you know, reintroduce rifampin at this time since he's stable and he's doing well. Um, you know, I guess the idea is why try to fix something if it's not broken? So um, the patient has agreed that 
you know, it's much better for him to just, you know, go ahead and, and be safe and, and do the 18 months than to try and uh, mess with the medications and then have some complications. Right, that's a really good point. Um, rifampin is such an important drug to uh, keeping, a, keeping a regimen to a short um, six-month um, time frame. So without it, you're really having to look at a longer period of treatment. Um, and in this situation, unfortunately, he wasn't, he was having a lot of different kinds of um, reactions to medications, it sounded like, the levofloxacin as well. Um, Lana, I see some other really great questions coming in. Like, yeah, um, so uh, just south of you, uh, we have a question from Clark County. Um, they're wondering uh, kind of what your county caseload is like, just for sort of an average annually. Annually, um, right now we have about uh, 30. That's, that's a pretty good number for a county. So yeah, and you know, we also take care of the managing the, the, the contacts that come up to be LTBI so that um, each patient comes along with uh, some extra, um, I don't want to say work, but uh, it adds to the load of, of work for the nurses because we do offer LTB medications, LTBI medications for um, their contacts. Definitely. Um, oh, sorry. And as a, actually, as a follow-up, um, uh, is there a difference, or what, what is your county follow-up for or involvement for extra pulmonary TB without uh, pulmonary involvement? I'm sorry, Lana. Say that again. Oh, sorry. Um, so, kind of as a follow-up to that as well, is um, what is your involvement with extra pulmonary TB if if pulmonary involvement is not the issue? Oh yeah, um, we we do um, follow them in terms of uh, making sure that we we get reports from what their management care is like from their their managing providers, and that um, we do share that with the TV consultant. So he does have a kind of a a sense of what's going on, and he'll step in if he has any recommendations. Um, so do, we do have oversight on the extra pulmonary TB also. I was just wondering back to, you mentioned about contacts, um, that you also do manage contacts as well. And you, you did mention that there was a toddler in this household. Maybe you could just say a word or two about the evaluation of the toddler and whether um, treatment was um, needed for either the toddler or the wife and what you treated with. Oh, right. Uh, so we, um, we did the screening. Uh, we did a uh, CBD test on the, the toddler, um, and it was negative. So we put uh, her on Profi medication. Uh, the mother was um, positive. Uh, she was a native of you know, her, uh, the same endemic country, so that wasn't much of a surprise. Uh, and she did complete her LTBI treatment. The toddler was retested eight weeks after um, her father was considered non-contagious, and fortunately, she was uh, negative. Okay, thank you. Um, Lana, back to you. Yeah, um, so I actually have just a, a question uh, for my from myself. Um, how do you assess? How did you assess for depression? Um, and what would you have done if the patient uh, like declined to cooperate with that? Oh yeah, good question. So yeah, for the cycloserine, they one of the things you want to watch out for is some psychiatric symptoms, um, paranoia or depression. And I um, had read in, in that uh, Drug-Resistant Tuberculosis, a survival guide for clinicians, that book in, in, in uh, Chapter 5 under cycloserine, it actually had recommended the Beck's inventory 
I think it's called the sex depression inventory. And um, that's kind of a, a 21 item questionnaire that, that the patient just kind of self um, does. And um, it's very simple for the patient. Um, so I, I Googled it, and I, I got the PDF uh, form. Um, and um, I did ask the, the patient for a baseline on that. Um, he wasn't very interested, so I, I didn't have a lot of uh, cooperation in that department. He was just you know, assuring me that he didn't have anything. So I did monitor him. Um, I watched for any symptoms of depression or any paranoia, and um, I asked, you know, the wife and, and him, I said, it's very important that you let me know if you have any of the following symptoms. So I went through things to watch for, and he agreed that he would let me know. Um, but every time I went, he seemed uh, in a good mood. He was playful with his child. He was going to work. Um, he didn't appear to have any symptoms, but I, I, yeah, I did ask him several times to complete it, and he didn't, and there was nothing that I could really force him to do. Yeah, and in a situation like that, you probably would really, hopefully, really work with uh, um, the family members around that patient to ensure that they're also keeping an eye out and know to call. I imagine that's probably what you did as well. Right, and fortunately, he wasn't on cycloserine for, um, it was probably less than two months. Okay, great. And there was another question. Uh, maybe we've got enough time for this one. Um, Julie was wondering if there were any cultural issues that you encountered with uh, working with this family or any language barriers, and if so, how did you manage that? Right. Um, no. Uh, from the country that he came with, they they spoke English, so um, we didn't have any problems with the um, language, um, and I didn't um, have any cultural issues either. Okay, great. I think maybe we've got still maybe time for another question or two, depending on how long it goes. Lana. Um, so uh, Julie also asked, uh, another Julie actually asked a really good question. What medicines uh, were continued after dropping the amikacin and uh, cycloserine? I think, I'm wondering if we answered this. Yeah, he was, yeah, he, he eventually was just on uh, moxifloxacin, ethambutol, and INH. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There's another question from Julie Rose about the the NATS. Are NATS done on the BAL or biopsy specimens? And um, they they were they they did them. Um, they were cultured out, and they did have um, they did have positive NATS. Okay, thank you, Elba. Um, I don't see any other question that we haven't answered unless you're aware of one, Lana. Uh, no, all except for do we have a TB hospital in our region? I can answer um, no, we do not have a TB hospital in our region. And then Mary, say, Mary did ask about um, any drugs that were used to combat the edema. Oh, yes. So... I think uh, that was, that was the patient was on prednisone, right? I mean, for the for the iris. Right. Uh, I think in the hospital at one point they did put him on Lasix because he had some the pulmonary edema and uh, but nothing that he used continually. Okay. Thank you so much, Elba. Um, this concludes today's webinar, uh, but before you log off, there are a few reminders that Jeannie will address. I just wanted to, before we move to that, to thank you, Elba, for sharing your experience with this very challenging case. 
And I think you provided some really excellent examples of important case management activities that um, had they not been done and had you not followed through with those things, um, the outcome for this patient could have been quite different. So thank you so much for sharing your experience. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, so I have a few things to mention. So uh, please complete your individual online Qualtric evaluation. It should have been sent to your email addresses via the web workshop email. Uh, we do value your feedback and input as we use your feedback to shape some of our trainings. For those who c completed all the required steps, your nursing CEUs or uh, participation certificates will be available on the Curry Center website within the 12 weeks. We will send an email with the certificates with instructions. One last reminder before you log off. Group members who do not pre-register, please provide us with your full name and email address by entering it in the chat window or by sending it um, in our email um, at the web workshop. Then you can send, um, then we'll send you the online evaluation to complete. Please feel free to contact us if you have any questions or concerns. For your convenience, I will leave the Adobe Connect open for another five to 10 minutes so you can input your information in the chat window. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope to see you all again in the future trainings. Thank you.